My name is Jay Begley. I'm an aquatic ecology specialist with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Purdue University. Um, my background is working with fish and aquatic insects in the Midwest, um, a lot of rivers and streams and some ponds and lakes. Um, so I get to be in a lot of different aquatic ecosystems. Um, I also work with a group that maintains some weather buoys out in Lake Michigan. So those buoys monitor um, real processes in the lake, so waves and wind and all that kind of stuff. And it's those processes that I want to talk about today. So water is unique in several different ways that is really important to the organisms that live there. And we're going to talk about how this water changes throughout the year and how fish kind of adapt and respond to these changes. So first I thought I'd start talking about um, winter, which is when ice is on the lake. Okay, so as we know, um, ice, which is in this cup here, hopefully you can see it okay, um, is less dense than the water it's in. So what that means is like, as something becomes more dense, it gets heavier for the same amount of space. So if you have an ice cube floating on top of the water, that's less dense than the water around it. Whereas a lot of liquids, what happens is when they become a solid, they become more dense and sink to the bottom. So water is kind of cool in that it lets the coldest part be at the top. And what that makes is it makes um, a four degree Celsius consistent temperature in the bottom of the lake because as the water gets colder than four degrees, it floats as ice. And as it gets warmer than four degrees, it floats because it's less dense. So there's this magic number like four degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit that kind of separates the water density. Um, and what I'll talk about now is the way that we kind of progress from ice off through the rest of the year and back to winter, okay? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, as the, the air heats up the ice, it melts. And once that water becomes four degrees Celsius, the entire lake becomes a consistent temperature and it can mix. And so all this mixing can be called turnover. And in the spring, when we have turnover, that constant four degree temperature in the lake can only last sometimes for just a couple of hours, sometimes for a couple of days. And it's really dependent on air temperature and, and, and wind speed. So after it mixes, we get a nice warm spring day without hardly any wind and this top layer can begin to heat up, okay? And when that layer heats up, it actually becomes different enough in density that it doesn't wanna mix with the bottom layer. So I did that with this fish tank here. I had cold water I filled the tank with, and I put a lamp over the top, and I heated up just the top part of the water. And what that did was make a nice, less dense layer on the top, in a more dense layer on the bottom. And where this separation happens, you can almost see it. I'm gonna put some dye in here to make it easier to see. But you can almost see the difference in density between these two waters um, within the same tank. And so that will happen in a lake. And so what you can have, you can have like a warm water fish like this walleye who likes to be near the thermocline or up in the warmer part of the water and he can choose that in the lake um, during the summer because it's all, it's separated that way by temperatures. And then you can have this coho salmon who likes colder waters and they'll live down in the bottom part where it's nice and cool. And then they can come up and get food as they, as they need to. Um, the separation is really nice because it, it gives the lake more habitats in the summer. So what I'm gonna do is to make it a little easier to see the separation in here, I'm going to drip some cold blue water into here and then some warm red water and hopefully we can see where the division is between the two layers a little clearer here. Okay, so that's showing up pretty well. You can see how it's sinking to the bottom, right? Okay. Let's see what happens when we put the red water in. Okay, I can even drip it down a little lower and it should still come up towards the top here. 
Oh, squirted that one free. Yeah, you see how that water shot right back up towards the top? That's because there's a difference in, t in density between the two temperatures of water. And so the fish can choose to be in the bottom cool part or the warm upper part. And not only the fish, but actually algae and things that eat algae like zooplankton can move up and down in the water column. So if um, an, an algae wants to be more productive because it's warmer, because uh, in warmer waters it can produce more energy, then it will be up in the top area. And so fish are that way too. They can control their metabolism, which is the way, how much energy they burn. So if a fish wants to burn less energy, it can be in cooler water and more energy, it can be in the upper water, depending on what it needs to do. But that's not all. What can happen when this happens in the lake is, um, how many of you ever seen a pond or lake where it didn't blow all summer long, right? That never happens. So I have a fan here I'm gonna turn on. And I'm going to show you what happens to this water as wind blows across it and shifts it around. Okay. So these different layers are called stratifications. Okay. So the water can stratify. A lot of you have probably seen stratification when you've driven along a road that cuts through a hillside or a mountain. And you can see the different layers of rock. Those are stratified layers. Okay. So water does something very similar based on this density. And so what hopefully will happen here is we'll be able to see the wind push this nice warm layer across the top. And then the blue underneath, so you can see it here, will begin to shift up. And so this happens a lot in natural lakes. So when we think of like Lake Erie, for example, the wind can blow all the way across Lake Erie and squish the water up towards um, Buffalo, New York, and they see really high water levels. And then what happens is all the weight of this water on this end squishes down the cold water, and that cold water comes up on this side, and that's called um, a seiche. Hold on, adjust my fan here real quick. Um, and so what that can do is then begin to rock back and forth and change the water levels at different ends of the lakes at different times. So while Buffalo, New York might get really high waters over near Detroit area and Sandusky area of Ohio, it might go down. Um, so I'll let this go for a couple more seconds here <clears throat> and then I'm gonna shut it off and hopefully we'll be able to see the two layers rock back and forth. Um, you guys may have experienced a thermal climb before, if you've ever been swimming in a pond or a lake and you've stuck your feet down pretty deep and the water feels really, really cold, but up where you're swimming, it's nice and warm, that's a thermocline and fish can choose where to be in regards to that thermocline. Okay, so I'm going to shut this off and we'll see if it'll start rocking for us. So what ends up happening is you have fish that live near shore, so they're up along the shoreline here on this lake. And as the thermocline, we'll say this is the thermocline, as it rocks, like if it goes down to here and then up to here and then back down here, the fish have to choose to move with it or not. So they can swim to stay in their preferred habitat as that goes up and down. And so that's why you see fish sometimes moving inshore and offshore is because they're staying with that thermocline to try to find their optimum temperature. Um, let's see, is it rocking at all? It looks, looks like not much. I'll leave the fan on a little bit more here. Um, and if that doesn't work, uh, you'll just have to take my word for it that it really, it really does rock back and forth. Um, but what's cool is not only is this difference in density um, important for the fish, but it has some real consequences. So the water on the bottom that's colder here is effectively cut off from the surface. So that water can't get oxygen from the surface anymore. And if that goes on long enough, in some places you can deplete the oxygen from this lower part. So if you have fish that need cold water, they need to be down in this cold water, but you don't have enough oxygen, you can actually lose these fish in those ponds and lakes. Um, one way that a lot of people try to manage their pond to keep this from happening is they'll put pumps uh, or fountains out in their pond 
and that'll mix all of this water up so that the water stays a more consistent temperature and you don't get the separation between the cold and the hot and the fish have more oxygen available. Um, in like big lakes like Lake Michigan, which doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients in it, we don't have a problem with oxygen in the bottom because what uses up oxygen in the bottom is dead and dying algae and organisms and then bacteria that lives in the sediment. So there's not a whole lot of that decomposition that happens in Lake Michigan. But in Lake Erie or a pond, there's a lot of squishy dead stuff down there all eating it up, using up all that oxygen and there's not a way for more oxygen to come in. Um, so that's really important depending on what lake you're in, depends on how much oxygen is available for fish down here. Um, so let's see if we can get this to go. Okay, so I'm gonna shut it off here and we'll see if my fish tank will rock for me or not. All right, well, it worked really well the other day. <laughs> so what's supposed to happen is the wind is supposed to blow the red. And it's supposed to squish down like this, causing a downwelling, which means the warm water squishing down here. And then that makes the blue side come up, creating an upwelling. And in some places of the world, these upwellings are the only place that nutrients kind of get reintroduced to the water. So you'll see lots of algae and fish and stuff growing in those kinds of places. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that when there's not enough oxygen down here, sometimes um, that lack of oxygen causes um, contaminants to be released from the sediment, um, such as uh, sulfur and methane gas can be released. And so that can make this bottom layer pretty toxic for fish too. So that leads us to our next part, okay? What happens if you have, you have a nice thermocline here where your lake is all separated and your fish are living, you know, along the thermocline or below the thermocline and the water starts to cool because of air temperature. If you get a good storm and some nice cool temperatures, that thermocline can disappear pretty quickly. And as that thermocline disappears, that means all the water is four degrees again. It's all the same temperature. And that mixing releases some of that methane and sulfur in the, the, the ponds and lakes with a lot of energy. And that can mix in and kill fish. So sometimes we get reports of fall fish kills where fish die because of some of those contaminants. Well, they're not contaminants. Some of those um, products of the anoxic environment there. Um, so as fall goes on, the lake turns over like that and slowly we get ice forming again. So as the ice forms on the surface, it again cuts off the bottom of the lake. So in lakes that have a lot of nutrients in them, we can have oxygen problems in those again because they can't get oxygen from the surface. Um, but there's a couple things we can do to help prevent that from happening in smaller bodies. And one of the ways we do that is with, again, an aerator or fountain. People will let those run late into the year sometimes to prevent the ice from forming. Another thing is if our ice is clear, so if the ice is, has no snow on it and it's nice and clear, algae underneath there can actually produce oxygen. Because plants, when they, when they produce, <laughs> plants produce oxygen and use CO2 when they're photosynthesizing, when they're making energy, at night, they will use oxygen too, but if you don't have too many plants, it's not a problem. And so having clear ice can help some of those ponds and lakes. Um, the important thing to realize is that as all of these changes are happening, most of those changes are seen near the top of the lake. And as you get further down, it's a fairly consistent temperature and fish can move up and down to their preferred range. In, the, in this region of the world, the Midwest, um, we have a temperate climate, which means that, uh, that, that it freezes and thaws and gets nice and warm in the summers. Um, the fish that live here are adapted to that. And so they can tolerate the cold and the warm and each species has a different preference. So salmon like coho and chinook, they like much colder temperatures than bass and walleye and bluegill, which you'll find in the warmer, warmer sections of the water. So by having the water density control the, the temperature range, 
it allows fish to pick those preferred habitats. Um, and with that, I think if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I know I went pretty quickly over some pretty tough topics, so I'd be happy to take any questions you have. All right, we got it down, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> so um, a lot of times in like the, the more northern lakes, you'll see the thermocline not be as deep because it doesn't get as many warm days. And in those lakes, you often see a lot more cool and cold water fish. And, and that's because there's not as much habitat for the warm water fishes. If you want, I can flip the fan on. Maybe we can get it to actually rock back and forth. Um, or I could even try shaking the fish tank to get the, <laughs> to get the stuff to move. But I think it's just not going to cooperate with us today. Um, I, While we're I got, waiting on that, Jay, can you explain maybe how the difference in temperatures affects fishing? Yeah, so the, the temperature can affect like what kinds of fish you're fishing for and where you're fishing. So if you're um, interested in salmon and it's the middle of summer, you're going to want to fish down in this region of the lake because the, the salmon are going to be in the cold water except for when they're foraging. So they'll, they'll be swimming down here and they'll look above them for some food and they'll shoot up there and get what they want to eat and go back down. So depending on where this thermocline is, depends on how deep you need to fish. So a lot of times on fishing forums and websites, you'll see people discussing like what temperature they're fishing at. And that all relates to this thermocline because there's that nice gradient. So a lot of times fishermen target a specific temperature to catch their fish because they know that's where they'll find them. Um, on the shoreline, it gets a lot harder because as the thermocline goes up and down each day, that location can change. So one day the fish might be up really close to shore because it's nice and warm near there. And the next day it could oscillate the other way and you could get cold water up there. So you wouldn't find them. So it can, it can change pretty quickly, even in a big lake. And we right. can- And it does look like you almost have a little bit of the rocking back and forth. Um, the red is coming down. We have one more question. Okay. Um, this one is, do humans have any effect on the temperature of the water with pollution or anything else? Um, we can have an impact, especially on small ponds and um, especially ponds. You don't see it much in the Great Lakes. Uh, the volume of water is so big that uh, even some places where we have warm and hot water release, it's pretty localized. Um, so the water doesn't tend to spread out far enough to have an impact on the whole lake. But you can see it in certain areas like uh, that may have warmer water pumping out. You'll see uh, warmer fish near there, warmer bodied fish. Yeah. And we have a couple more. Is the thermocline just a small thin area or can it be multiple feet deep? So the thermocline can actually be multiple feet deep. Um, it's this area of the steepest change in temperature. So if you have nice and warm and then it gets colder quickly, that change in temperature is where the thermocline is, and it's not a defined thickness. It can be it can be pretty variable, um, so it's not just set like as five foot or whatever. It's, it can vary. The next question is: As you mentioned, the bottom cold area can be depleted of oxygen. When there's a mixing event, can this lead to dangerously low oxygen levels through the whole lake? Then, or will it equal out? Uh, in some cases, it can. Um, usually for, for the Great Lakes, it doesn't happen. Uh, there's enough volume of water with well oxygenated areas that that doesn't tend to happen. Um, but if you have a small pond where the, the bottom layer is pretty thick and makes up a big chunk of that water and all the oxygen gets depleted from there, then when it mixes, there's potential that there's low, too low of oxygen for especially small fish, or I'm sorry, especially large fish. Um, and in fact, in the spring, when we see fish that have died from low oxygen over the winter, 
it's usually the biggest fish that are hurt first because they have higher oxygen requirements. So a lot of times you'll have all your small fish survive a winter, but the bigger fish die off because there wasn't enough oxygen. So that, that's a really good sign that you had an oxygen problem in your pond or lake is if you, and when the ice melts, you see a lot of dead fish, but they're all bigger fish and not a lot of smaller fish. All right, we'll try turning this fan off here. Might not be easy to pick up on the camera too. Yeah, that little bit right there is coming back up. So it's rocking just very slowly. I need a bigger fan, I think. <laughs> if anybody has any more questions, we'll take a, a couple last questions and then we'll hop off. All right, in moving bodies of water, like a river or a creek, can these thermoclines happen as well, or is it moving too much? You don't usually see it in a river or a creek, um, but you can see it in like a reservoir, which is a river that's been dammed up. So sometimes that'll slow the water down enough that you'll get a thermocline in that reservoir, especially large reservoirs. And so the reason that's important in a reservoir is everything that lives in that stream is adapted to live in um, the temperature of water as it changes through the summer. So if you have a reservoir where the top layer is warm like a normal so summer stream, but the bottom layer is really cold and your dam releases the cold water, that can impact the organisms that live downstream and you can actually see a difference because of that really cold water release versus the top. But in a, a stream that's not dammed up, you don't usually see any kind of thermocline develop. And we have time for one last question, if anybody has one. All right, looks like we're good to go. Thanks, Jay. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. All right, bye, guys.